Tonight, the rifle that almost replaced the M4. A man scratches another man's back. And we finally arrive at the great room. It's all happening now on the 1911 Syndicate. Ah, the Grey Room. It's both littered with some of HK's most famous guns, but also a shrine for some of their projects that never came to be. And there's one with a particularly interesting tale. There's likely no bigger swing for the fences than the XM8. In many ways, this gun is the reason HK's US manufacturing facility exists. The XM8 came from the Army's next generation service rifle competition known as OICW, or Objective Individual Combat Weapon. Operating on the same short stroke gas piston system found in the G36, the XM8 was meant to be a modular service rifle that would replace the M16. And if it weren't for politics, it may have succeeded. Of course, the only sad thing about a gun like this is you could never shoot it out of fear of damaging an irreplaceable artifact. Right. This is a special moment. This is pretty cool. It's yeah. not the worst room I've been in. Yeah. No, it's pretty cool. It's gray. <laughs> um, you know, a lot of gray. And um, more than three firearms in, in this room, uh, none of which are lame. It's pretty freaking cool where we are. There will be another video where we're uh, really diving into some of the gray room's guns. That'll be coming up in a couple of weeks. But today, we are looking at what I think is one of the more fascinating HK stories, the XM8, I'm really talking about sort of that story. Also, almost the theme of the series is sort of telling the full story, because a lot of times there's misunderstandings on, you know, oh, well, it failed, and you go, well, hey, hang on, let, let, let's, you know, kind of get the record straight here. So we'll be talking about the XM8. Um, we'll take you to some range footage. Um, show you sort of manual of arms, how these bad boys work, talk about the history with the OICW program. We got a pretty neat little prop we'll bring in here in a minute. Show some different variants we got from PDWs to DMRs to uh, grenade launchers, all kinds of cool stuff. And then, um, sure, the XM8 was not adopted, but that's not to say that it isn't without significance and success uh, tied to the, um, you know, creation of something that wasn't ultimately adopted. So we'll get into that. Chris, though, I got a question for you. Yeah, man. You got anything on your waist right now? I got a belt. Uh huh. This belt. Yep. Where'd you get it? I got it from a company called Segera. Do you got a belt? I do. The same freaking one as you. Oh. Um, which, you know, should tell you that they must be great because two dudes here wearing one. James wears a leather belt, of course, because he's a leather He's a classic belt. man. I mean, look, <laughs> he's got polos. Yeah. Know, I mean, come on. Tucked yeah. in shirt. He would never dare wear, you know, anything with Velcro <laughs> on it. But, um, 
So anyway, we got a code there you guys can plug in. 1911 Syndicate saves you 10% off their site. We got a couple of reviews that we've done on their stuff prior to them being a sponsor, I would note, just so you don't think that those were shill videos. Um, so anyway, go check that out. Let's talk about sort of the history and the where this thing came from. It's a quite fascinating story. Okay, so to talk about the XM8, you really have to go to a prior project led by the Army, the OICW, or uh, Objective Individual Combat Weapon. Um, and this is a, um, you know, non-functional working example, kind of a test model that we have on display. But I mean, you guys would look at this and say, okay, that's pretty outlandish even for the 90s, really <laughs> very much of a Starship oh, Troopers. Oh, yeah, full, full, full wild. Full wild, yeah. yeah. And to tell that story, you really kind of go full circle back to where we started this video series with the M27, um, where we talked about those Army-led programs, um, Project Salvo, um, Project Nimblick, uh, the SPEW project, uh, leading up into the 80s with the CAUSE program and then the ACR program. Um, all of those things were around providing the individual soldier with more volume of fire and that was going to be able to help win the, win the day. So moving into the 90s, they saw this as the way to move forward from the current M16, M203 combination. Mm -hmm. um, so it's kind of a reverse. Now we have the rifle on the bottom and the grenade launcher on the top. And optic on top, top and a right? massive <laughs> optic on top. Yeah, uh, very ambitious program. H um, and K uh, was tasked with the phase one portion, which was the XM8 rifle portion, and then we had another uh, company who was building the grenade launcher <coughs> system, and then obviously we have the optic system. Um, ultimately, at the end of the 1990s, the program stalled uh, simply because they were never able to get the overall weight requirement down to where it needed to be. Um, as you might think, the complexity of the optic related system and then some lack of potential from the grenade itself. You can see this is a training practice round of a current 40 millimeter mm -hmm. grenade that we would have from M203 or now the M320 from H and K. And this is the size of the grenade um, that was fired from this. Hmm. The benefit of a smaller size was now we had a semi-automatic capability, multiple shots, there and then with the really complex system, you had the ability to range find your target, laser designate, and then program the individual round to either point detonate or air burst above the target or detonate, or, or sorry, impact and then detonate after. Um, and because they had to shrink that down and then you can imagine all the circuitry that's in there, mm -hmm. the, the actual lethal payload of this was not what they wanted Pretty minimal. And the back magazine was for the Grenades. explosives, yep. front magazine, Stanek pattern mag, mag for, Correct. for yep. 556. Yep. Yep. So that takes us you know, into, the, into the 1990s with really kind of a stalled program for the future of um, the infantry's weapon system. Okay, and now we fast forward into the beginning of uh, the 2000s. And as we know, really soon after that, we had September 11th, and then we had the global war on ter terrorism response uh, that came out of that. For the U.S. Army specifically, um, what that meant was an obvious demand um, to provide the best equipment across the range of things that an individual Army soldier needs to head into battle that was possible. Leading up to that point, uh, we didn't have a whole lot of money going into mm -hmm. uh, the U.S. military. <clears throat> right. And um, the leadership, as you would expect leaders to do, realized that they were kind of had a lot of shortfalls. So there was a mandate that was coming down really from the top to say, let's find ways to get around the long bureaucratic process of acquiring all of this range of stuff we need and get it a little bit faster out to the soldiers so when they deploy, they've got what they need. Not that big a deal if what we're talking about is getting every soldier pair of Oakleys, yeah. <laughs> but if we're talking about replacing the right. uh, service rifle for the U.S. Army, it's a bigger deal, and that we'll see will kind of come back to, to bite us at the end of the story here. Mm -hmm. um, but working under that mandate specifically, you had uh, the program office for the U.S. Army, which 
takes initial requirements and then turns them into a solution and then can push that forward through testing and development to actual adoption. They looked back and said, okay, well, we had this already established program of record with the OICW. It's stalled right now because of the grenade launcher portion of it, the phase two mm. XM25, but we're really happy with the XM8 rifle. If we separate that off and we push that forward, now we might have a much better um, rifle system for the U.S. soldier. Mm -hmm. And so that's what they ran with. And, uh, you know, I I'm, I'm, don't have time in this video to get into all the nit nor details of, uh, of the process through which that went. Um, but basically, they went back to H&K and said, hey, we like this rifle. Let's pull these pu push pins, take it off. Can you build this into a family of weapons? Mm -hmm. And that's what they did uh, with XM8. <clears throat> Initially, H&K um, just presented them with the G36. And this is a G36K issue weapon. It was already in service with the uh, German armed forces. And the basis of that weapon, underneath all the external look of it, it's the same short stroke gas sure. piston operated system. Yeah. But the US Army program department said, yeah, we don't want that. We want it to look a little bit different. You know, more of a Starship Troopers look they were happy with. And, um, Which is so funny. Yeah, is there, was there like a reason why? behind that or just because? I think they wanted something that was definably U.S. military mm. versus we're adopting somebody else's weapon. Okay. Um, right. And there's, there's, I can understand some little independence there um, as part of that. And H&K said, of course, we can do that for you. And they actually contracted a German design for, firm to do what we call the Audi stylizing. And they came back with what you can see here. Well, because it was, from my understanding, it wasn't automotive, like design yeah, firm a, or something yeah. that they hired. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Which and is very interesting. Yeah. yeah. They did exactly yeah. what the Army asked them for. Internally, huh. this is pretty much a G36. Same short stroke gas piston operated system, uses the exact same magazine, um, functionally the same, and that's a good thing because it's a um, well-established, reliable, um, clean operating system. Uh, to base it off of. And for the XM8 program, they envision this as a family of weapons. So the base receiver is the same on all the weapons, but it's how you accessorize it beyond that. So the first model you see here, this is their PDW or personal defense size weapon with the uh, nine inch barrel. They also came up with a carbine length version with a 12 and a half inch barrel. And then you had the 12 and a half inch barrel with the XM320, which would later go on to be the M320 and adopted sure. by US military service, kind of yeah. upgraded M203. And then they and then came then up the with DMR. a 20 inch heavy uh, barrel DMR version, as well as once they worked through the program a little bit more and talked back with the requirements um, side on uh, from the infantry house, said we also want a infantry automatic rifle uh, version. So they basically took the same weapon, gave it a, a 100 round drum magazine, and that was fielded as well. Hmm. But the same basic rifle, hmm. different uh, accoutrements on the on the weapon itself. Okay, well that's probably a good time. Huh. Why don't we, we'll take you guys to some range footage now and just show you just basic manual of arms on how these things work. Yeah, so here we're on the range getting to shoot the uh, XM8. We've got the personal defense weapon variant here with the short barrel. Uh, just wanted to talk about the functional and operational sense of the weapon. This is based off of the G36 with a short stroke uh, gas piston operating system. And we've got um, full ambidextrous controls. So you can see I've got a selector lever with safe semi and full automatic on both sides of the weapon. And then we have, like on a G36, a paddle magazine release. Uh, but on the XM8, they extended it down. They also added these tabs that are on either side. And what that allows you to do is either come up with your support hand and hit the mag release with your thumb, or if you wanted to use your trigger finger, you can just reach forward and hit the tab there to release the mag. So you've got options for either support hand or strong hand, left or right-handed shooter. You also, forward of the trigger, have a bolt release. So you can see I've got the bolt locked back to the rear now. If I wanted to go ahead and load a new mag into the weapon and seat it 
and then release the bolt, I can just push forward of the trigger, push down on that tab, and it releases the bolt forward. Pushing up on it and pulling back on the charging handle locks the bolt back to the rear. Then we have the charging handle. You can see it mounted here on the top of the weapon. It reciprocates with the action of the weapon because it's attached to the bolt carrier itself. So it'll go back and forth. If I wanted to charge the weapon, I can re release up and grab the charging handle, which again is ambidextrous. It moves on either side of the weapon and pull it back to the rear. It has a bolt hold open device, so it will lock back on an empty magazine. And also, if I pull it to the side and then push it in, it serves as a forward assist. So with the, with the weapon forward, if I didn't get it all the way in battery, I can just lock the side of the charging handle in and then tap it forward to make sure I go fully into battery and then I can run the weapon again. Pretty neat system, very lightweight, incredibly easy to control and something that is very intuitive for an operator to learn and become very proficient with very quickly. All right, let's go get this last mag in. Yeah, you got another one for me? Uh, nope, just about 20 rounds left. Oh, there's one on the table, I'll get it. Dude, I got a favor. I can't get this spot on my back, will you scratch my back? Please. It's like right here, I can't reach it, man. It's absolutely disgusting, but I will do it. Oh, really? Dude, I thought you were gonna tell me no. Turn around, big bear. Um, everyone, if you're uh, looking go up for, yep, you're go. looking for any ways right there. Uh, yeah, just keep going. Do the pitch. Go. If you're looking for any ways to support the 1911 syndicate, we would love to sell you a house, preferably an expensive one. Um, go left. Uh, how about over here? Two hands. There we go. Ah, there we okay. go. We're good. Um, we can Ooh. help you guys nationwide with your real estate needs. Um, Patreon also exists. That's more just uh, just giving us money for no real reason at all, just because you um, support this endeavor. The back scratching. Um, yeah, sign up for the newsletter, all that kind of stuff. Appreciate it. On with the video. So using the PDW variant as an example here, uh, what you see is a very modular uh, design to the weapon, uh, which uh, allows you to customize it to the specific needs and really at the armor level, modify this weapon into any of the other um, types that you'd like to have maybe at a, at a later date. At the rear, you have a fixed stock, um, but it's telescoping for length of pull. So you can adjust that out at multiple positions. Um, they also offered a folding version huh. that folds mm. off the side and has adjustability. You can see the recoil spring assembly and the recoil buffer is built into this. Um, so you had additional compact capability if you wanted. That'd fit in a backpack like that. It would, yeah, yeah very much so. Very cool. Um, the forward handguard, you just push one push pin and we can slide that right off and that will expose the gas piston and the recoil spring assembly. Allows you to um, mount you know, longer hand guards if you want or in the case of this carbine model, you can um, just with one push pin slide on your uh, grenade launcher module, um, which is obviously an advantage over the M203 system, which you had to do some significant mounting yeah. points on this. You take that on and off in Not 15 seconds. seconds. Well, you can still run a suppressor with that mounting solution right there. Yep. Where yeah. Yeah, you got clearance. You couldn't with the other one. Sure. So. Yeah. And I mean, hell, this is before, you know, what would have been. The aftermarket and everyone else got a hold of it and said, "All right, cool. Let's start going to work on yeah. handguards." And I mean, because we know that's just yeah. what happens. Yep. So it's like, huh. hey, this was the most baseline of baseline this thing was ever going to get. Yeah, you know. And then some people would look here and they'd see these two points or four points. You can see on the other uh, rifles, which are at the three, the six, um, and the nine o'clock positions. Um, this is called PCAP. And shouldn't be surprising, as the videos we've done before, you guys are aware that H&K loves to come up with their own proprietary mounting solutions. And this is another one of those that, although Picatinny rails were all the rage at that point, we're seeing them on everything, H&K could have done that, and they did offer that solution as well. Hmm. They found that their system was even better. Um, there are a couple of problems with with Picatinny, one, it's heavier. Um, adding yeah. all of those rails all over your weapon is gonna add weight, it's gonna add bulk. Um, it adds a snag hazard. The number of times we've all cut our, our knuckles on a Picatinny rail section becomes a challenge. Mm -hmm. And then you also, unless you put it directly on that exact same slot and you have a really tight lockup, your return to zero on those items is not the case. Yeah, and they just, you know, things just back up, you know, oh, I forgot to Loctite it, you know, yep. lights falling yeah. off. You know. yep. 
with PCAP, which is Picatinny Combat Attachment Points, you actually um, get around all those things. So this is actually a true return to zero. It's very low profile, doesn't add weight, not a snag hazard. Here's an example of a vertical forward grip. You would just mount in the front section of, of this and then the bottom section and then rotate it around until it locks in place and now it's secured. And you have the same thing with a laser or a light. And that also goes for how they mounted the optic solutions. There were several different optic variants from just standard red dots to red dot with visible laser, invisible laser. For the DMR version, they had a much more capable one with um, BDC reticles in there. And all you have to do is just hit the throw lever and you can pull off one <laughs> and then put on any variant of the other and it's a true return to zero um, for the optics. Yeah, you gotta admit, I mean, I mean, especially on optics, that actually really is. You know how nice that would be? That, that's ahead of, I'm sure someone's gonna chew me up for this, but in many ways, that's ahead of where we are now. Yeah. Optic comes off a gun, you yeah. have to go re-zero, you know? I mean, especially just, if they did testing to see that that would return to zero far better than standard Picatinny, correct? Yes, yeah. exactly. And that was that was obviously what H&K did before investing the time and money and effort into the system is they'd already figured that out and were <laughs> trying to come up with a better solution. Well, and it would seem like the optic, um, just that these optics are, are you know, well, yeah, maybe they're still functional, but the battery ain't uh, working anymore. But it looks like, um, you know, there's some degree of lasers coming out of the front of that thing. Correct. This specific model has a visible and an invisible laser as well as a standard red dot. And again, working with Insight Tech as a, uh, as a leader in the development of this, they were able to create a, a pretty interesting system. You know, as far as red dot optics, you know, the technology has moved on from yeah, 20 years ago. But with this specific one, one of the unique features of it was when you zeroed your red dot, it also automatically zeroed your lasers because they were slave to it. Unlike, you know, a PEC system that's mounted up here, I've got a I've got to zero my iron sights, I've got to zero my red hmm. dot, then I've got to zero this as well. Mm -hmm. And if I take them off the Picatinny, now I've got to zero them again. Um, and all in one system was uh, was definitely seen as an advantage at the time. Yeah, that's cool. Very, very, huh. very clever. Of course, that you know, the the downside to the PCAP system would just be the um, where you can put things. Correct. You're, you're you do, putting things in one place. Yeah, you don't have yeah. as many options of where to put it, and then obviously you're committed to now purchasing a different set of systems sure. yeah, um, of course. than what might have already been available. Yeah, Still, though, for cool. like a mission configurable rifle, real quickly between missions, different jobs, LPVOs, whatever, yeah. you could kit out your rifle in minutes for a different, completely different mission set, yeah. which yeah. is, again, very innovative. Yeah, it's just cool. I mean, you, you're going back over 20 years ago at this point. Yeah. You know? It's like, hey, that was a different, uh, you, know, you know, and I mean, the M4 market now with rails and accessories, I mean, obviously a lot of that spun out because of GWAT, and it's like, well, this was pre or you know very early during that so you just go hey look well, you know i mean the the innovation is incredibly interesting yep. okay so cool gun cool concept obviously this is not what the army is currently using so why yes yeah, so um extensive field testing within the time frame of the program um they had uh, hot weather testing that they did out at, uh, at Yuma Proving Grounds. They went up to Alaska, did cold weather testing. All of the feedback from um, those testings was on reliability and performance was exactly where they needed to be. There weren't any shortcomings. The uh, soldiers that, that were able to work with it all had positive reviews. Um, so it looked very favorable for it. But in the end, because of um, the massive amount of um, pushback they got from other um, companies within the firearms industry of not being able to have an open uh, big sure. com competition for this. And then within the U.S. Army's uh, invest, uh, Inspector General, they basically crushed the program of not being able to, uh, to fund it. So it ended at that step. And I think that's where a lot of people, if they're just reading the Wikipedia page, would stop and say, oh, it's a failure. Um, but it wasn't a failure as a weapon system. It was a failure through a you know, bureaucratic process to be adopted. Um, but I think all of us have found in having the amazing opportunity, thank you, H and K. Seriously. Uh, to get to shoot this, that it is really an incredible weapon. Yep. The thing that I noticed the most was how light 
and, and predictable the recoil is. Which is surprising because the gun is so light. So light. There's not you know, a lot of mass to stop Obviously, that heavy out. use of polymer like the G36, and you go, well, naturally you would assume that that's going to recoil a little bit heavier. And even on that PDW length, which is, I mean, even even lighter, you assume this, you know, with the uh, XM320 or, or whatever's going to be. But, I mean, that thing shoots very controllable. Yeah. Very controllable. And as we saw, you know, kind of introducing it to some of the staff members who hadn't had the opportunity to shoot a gray room gun either, um, it is very easy to teach a shooter with very limited amount of time to be very proficient with this gun. So uh, huge success in that statement. And then really, you know, you have to look for the greater terms of H and K and where they are here at uh, HK USA Today. This weapon is why we're sitting here in this, this room today in Columbus, Georgia. Is H and K had made such a commitment to the program that they moved their headquarters from Northern Virginia down here, built this facility in Columbus, Georgia, with the intent to actually produce the XM8 for the <laughs> U.S. military at the facility. When that contract ended, they postponed building that later production facility. But since that date, they've done that, and now we see them gearing up to be able to produce um, other you know, things other things that as a U.S. fan base, we're going to be happy to have here in the U.S. So in the grander terms, and you're not going to find that on the Wikipedia page, I see this as a, uh, a, win. a big success for yeah. H&K as a company. Well, you know, think about it like this. We talked about this when we talked on the phone, but we have it. So tell me if this is kind of fascinating to you, because you look, um, let's just say 20 years after that, and you go, okay, well, what's what's all the, the rage that the military is going through right now? SIG SPEAR program. Yeah. Okay. Well, think about what that is. Short stroke piston system. Okay, modular setup so that you can take off this upper, throw on a 300 blackout, mm -hmm. modular system, full ambidextrous, right? You go, uh, you know, being able to run different calibers, all that kind of stuff. You go, I, I mean, that's actually kind of fascinating that 20 years later, in essence, they're sort of adopting and getting behind a system that is very exactly similar that. to this. Yeah. Like, yeah. it's very similar. You know, yeah. it's, it's interesting. And, huh. and of course, there's politics that are way above my head on how all that stuff works, but you just go, I mean, that that is noteworthy. When you think about the direction things are moving now in terms of pistons, modularity, and everything, you go, they, they kind of were figuring it out right here. Yeah. Well, and, you know, words matter, as we've talked about, right? A newer modular platform. Well, it's not necessarily the case because this is older, right? As far as, like, SIG and the new stuff, yeah. right? Yeah, Everyone's yeah. like, it's new and it's modular, older and still mod modular and fit all the bills for what they're going for nowadays. Uh, shoot, and you go back to, you know, MP5 from the 60s and you go, I, I, I mean, all the stuff that we're surrounded by right now, I, I mean, so much of it is modular. Virtually all of it is ambidextrous and damn near all of it's piston driven. You know, it's, it, it, it you know, ah, just interesting. Yeah. You know, you think about the evolution of sort of war fighting guns and everything. You go, I mean, this, this does hold a very interesting niche moment from the history book yeah, yeah you know agree. yeah very cool the more it changes the more it stays the same right? yeah any other things to add you feel pretty pretty you're just happy to be here i'm happy to be here <laughs> anytime i can come to the gray room is a happy day for me and i'm excited about our next gray room video we've got coming up you're damn right we do well here's the deal man you can't really defend yourself with an xm8 because you can't get one outside of this room correct but if but if any of the firearms in this room, you would want what? Firearms legal protection, which is legally justified self-defense scenario insurance, if you will. They have a couple different programs like the Lonely Man Program, the Married Man Program, and our code 1911 will save you about a third off each package. But if you carry a firearm, you want to defend yourself and your family, you should also have insurance. Just to say why, this is good. This is good, this, my friend. That's good. This is good. Okay, anyway, thanks to those dudes for their support. We'll see you guys next time.